Zdaj bomo nakrivali z Miranda Petrucič, glavno preiskovalno novinarko OCCRP-a in Centra za preiskovalno novinarstvo Sarajevo, ki je tudi del tej mreže OCCRP-a. Zdaj pa sam zanima, kako smo jezikovno ali lahko ono govori v svojem naravnem jeziku ali v angliščini? Naravnem jeziku. Priča je naš. Jaz sem pripremila prezentacijo na engleskem, tako da se naredim, da neče smetiti, što če slajte pripriti na englesko. Moje ime je Miranda Patricič. Jaz sem zdraživočki novinar in regionalni urednik za Balka in organizacije, ko se zove Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Mi smo pol, da tako je ranije držalo predavanje, je direktor te organizacije. Mi smo mreža izraživačkih novinara, koji pokrivaju v področju Balkana, Istočne Evrope, Rusije in Kavkaza, a imamo projekte v Meksiku in na Middle East. Jedan od projekta, da ko ja vodim, se zove Investigative Dashboard. In to je v principu tool, ko smo mi kreirali, kako bi novinari mogli, da izstražajo ljudi in firme, ko izlazi iz okvira njihovih granica. Ja to volim reči, jer stvarno mislim, da v današnjem dobu nikad nije bilo lakše izraživati ovšo firme. Znam, da to svima zvuči, ali nevjerovatno, ali ranije ove godine sem razgovarala sa Jamesom Steelom, on je Pulitzer Prize winning novinar iz Amerike. I on mi je rekao, da nekad ranije, kad bi se suzrel sa firmom Skipra, sa Bahama, bi morao da kupi aviokartu, da odi na lokaciju, da se pomoči, da dobi bilo kakvu informaciju, skupo to plati i otkrije, da je iza svega stoji P.O. Box. Ako poslušajte ovaj primjer sada? Ok, I apologize, this will switch to English. So I was saying that it's never been easier to investigate offshore. And if you look at the example that I'm going to tell you about, you will see how. Okay. Uh, this is a story about Telia Sonera. It's the uh, biggest telecom operator in Sweden. It's actually 50% of it's owned by the state. And in 2007, they paid $320 million to a company in Gibraltar. Gibraltar is another offshore jurisdiction. It's a tax haven. And uh, at the time, everybody thought, well, you know, who is behind this Gibraltar company? You know, why would a state license, telecom license, uh, would be obtained to an offshore company? But they had no evidence. Uh, until last year, when the reporters from the Swedish National College got in touch with me and said, can you take a look? Can you give us any information? And it turned out to be quite easy. Um, I got on my phone, I called the Gibraltar registration office. I said, um, so what kind of records do you have in company? And how can I get it? And they said, well, just pay 35 uh, euros. And three weeks later, on my desk, there was a box full, full of documents. Every single piece of paper that they ever filed in the Gibraltar was on my desk. And the documents contained shareholder records. They had the director changes. They even had a financial report. That's not typical for the offshores. The financial reports are carefully hidden. Uh, so, the, it turned out that uh, the Kilant was owned by, at the time, 24-year-old woman. And of course it raised the question, how would an Armenian woman receive $320 million for a telecom license in Uzbekistan? You know, Kumara Karimova, her family, they're, all, they're supposed to control everything. So we dig deeper, and we followed the paper trail. And that took us to Switzerland, it took us to the UK, it took us to Uzbekistan, it took us to Gibraltar again, and many other countries. And what we were able to find out is that this woman was a director of a company directly owned by Gulnara Karimova. We were also able to track down some other people that uh, were used to either stand as directors or, or secretaries of the companies, and that led us to other companies owned by Gulnara Karimova as well as her boyfriend. We published the story. It aired on Swedish College, and we basically said that uh, TV so narrow payment was actually arrived to the dictatorship regime in Uzbekistan. The day after, and this is what happens in the democratic societies. You know, people don't stay mute on such information. And the Prime Minister went and said, TV so narrow has to answer some serious questions. The prosecutors reacted immediately and they opened the investigation. A few days later, uh, after the investigation started, they started to seize the millions on the bank accounts. 
And the prosecutors were really good. They had a bunch of names, but they didn't know what those names, you know, who those people are. And they passed them to reporters. And what happened, they again got in touch with me and said, okay, we have a bunch of names. Can you help us, you know, see who they are? And I looked uh, different countries and different registries, and we found out that uh, people who uh, had access to the bank accounts were actually people who were directors of several uh, companies in France. Uh, once we got the company records from France, it turned out that Nada Karimova herself was the owner of those companies. And those companies were used to buy apartment building in Paris, you see there, and was used to buy a villa in Saint-Tropez. But even a bigger discovery was that this is a chateau, a castle, right next to Paris, which was owned by her boyfriend. This is where $320 million ended. We were able to follow the money tray all the way to the end. And a um, month, few months ago, the French police raided twice uh, the, 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 all these properties in France. We don't know what's going to happen with Nara Kudimova. It's actually uh, a suspect in Sweden. And they might call her for a question. So, we had offshore jurisdiction and we had the good old reporting, which made this a fact. So, how do you do that? Well, the first and key step is background in people. Okay. You need to know as much as you can of the people who you're investigating. You know, who are the people who, are, who they are going to likely use to own the company on their behalf? Uh, I don't know if any of you have read our stories on Miroslav Mishkovic, but he was, uh, his director of a number of belief companies was actually his doorman. Uh, literally, a doorman. Um, so, it's very important to know first, you know, your subject. You know, what day they were born, where they were born, and what kind of citizenship they might have. That's the only way you can figure out that this person is actually the one you're looking for and not ten others. And then, of course, for their close relatives, very typical, uh, you, I know you had a session on um, uh, Syria earlier today and uh, I was looking actually to ownership of a company owned by a, a family of Assad and it turns out his wives and he, uh, the wives of um, the different wives of the family and their children are the one who owns companies, not the key people, key men themselves. Uh, and then of course, you know, who are the business partners, uh, close friends? Avetian was an employee. Uh, in the case of Gulana Karimova, some other people who appeared in her companies were actually her children's nanny. Would you believe that? And the governess teaching her children. Mubarak okay. um, and Salam, this was a story I did with the reporters in Egypt. Uh, they were looking into ownership of companies by uh, Hosni Mubarak. It turned out many of the assets he owned were actually owned by Hussein Salam. He was the front man who had all these assets. And of course, my favorite topic, Jokanovic. It's all the three. <laughs> same trinity. And of course, the same thing goes with looking into companies. You need to know where they're registered, where they're likely registered. And then, of course, some other countries where they might appear. You would see that if you start looking through um, a company's name, there are dozens of companies with the same name registered in different jurisdictions. And very often, you would see that those are actually the same group of companies. So. You have that. How do you solve the puzzle? Uh, there are many, many, many databases. You don't know them, but you know, if you were to look, for example, for information on Cyprus, uh, now within five minutes you can get information on directors, shareholders, and any loans that the company has taken. It's that easy. So, there are general databases. I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, LexisNexis, or Orbis, or Mint Global. Anybody? Just do. Okay, you better familiarize yourself. The beauty of those databases, and I wish I had my laptop with me, but um, the technical, I, I couldn't uh, plug it in. So I would show you the database. But you, uh, if, if you ask, uh, usually the US like cultural centers or US embassies in different countries have access to um, LexisNexis. Uh, you should definitely try to make a phone call and see who else might have it. Arbis, very often you'll see that business school have, schools have access to it. And the students, you know, they don't see the value of those information. Come on, they're not looking at the ownership of companies. But those information actually exists in those databases. So, if you go to LexisNexis, what these big companies do is they pay a lot of money to collect business records from different jurisdictions. So, for example, LexisNexis, the version I had, have 800 business registries around the world. 
Some have more, some have less information. But what they allow me is to search by any term I want. So it's not just, you know, normally if you look at the business registry, they don't really allow you to search by a nationality of person. They don't allow you to search by name very often. LexisNexis allows you to use any word you want. So I can search for all Slovenes who are directors of companies in UK. Now I can fish for information. I'm sure Paul told you about fishing, fishing. Look for stories. Okay. The same thing is with uh, uh, Arbus. Okay. Arbus collects a lot, a lot, a lot of business registries. It also collects the financial reports on the companies. And another thing which, which it does, because it collects all this information, you can see the subsidiaries, which is something that's very often very difficult. You know, it would take me you know, three months to search every single business registry, even if it had that capability to find which other companies this one company has. Now, I'll uh, tell you a little bit, a little bit later why knowing which are the subsidiaries so useful when you're investigating offshores. Uh, this is, I mentioned at the beginning of the session on uh, investigative dashboard. Uh, at, we were established three years ago, and at the time we spent months literally checking every single country in the world for company information. We did the work for you. Uh, if you go to this website and then go to the section called um, company registries, and you choose any country in the world, it's going to give you a link, direct link, to business registry that in that country. So if you're looking for something in uh, Brazil and you don't speak Portuguese, you go here and you find the right link. You know, if you're looking for Panama, you don't know what the name of the Panama registry is. You just go here and you'll get again, again a direct link. And that's a tool I very often use myself. Okay. Another tool I use are official gazettes. How many of you have read official gazette? Again, very few people. You know why they're useful? Because, again, business registry doesn't allow you to search with whatever you want. In many countries in the world, when you establish a company, you need to publish a notice in a government gazette. So you would know, typically say that um, we, these people, or these companies are incorporating a company here. Here are our directors, this is our address, this is our capital. Every time a director changes, they would publish a notice saying, you know, director change, this is a new director. Okay. When the shareholders change again, you would see the notice that the shareholders of this company have changed. Okay. This is an example from Luxembourg. Uh, again, a tax haven. Okay. Many people establish companies there to hide assets, uh, to basically save on taxes, but also hide their assets. If you go to the official registry of Luxembourg, and you try to search by the name, zero, you can't search it. If you try to search by the company, you will get many records, but you will actually not find out who the shareholders are. The only place where you can find out who the shareholders of the Luxembourg companies are is actually in the official gazette. So what I've done, I've downloaded the whole Luxembourg gazette on my computer, made it searchable, and now I can put any country, any name, and find out who owns the companies there. Super, super, super tool. You should have it for the countries you're investigating. The court cases. Uh, you know, people got into business disputes. And there are many, many even online registries. For example, in the UK, you can find the all court cases involving different companies online. And it's actually searchable by any term you want. You know, the same goes uh, with a number of other jurisdictions. And even in the offshore jurisdictions, there are courts. And they set with different issues. So, for example, this is a website called Offshore Alert. And there you can find court cases involving jurisdictions like the British Virgin Islands, uh, like Bahamas, a number of others. And see the cases involving either your country or the company to investigate. Okay. When, you know, there, when you are at the dead end, you don't know who the shareholder is, or maybe the business partner is got some dispute. I got quite a few stories just by looking up the court records in other jurisdictions. Okay. And the final tool is straight database. I'm sure Paul mentioned the Panama, I'll show, you, show it to you a bit later. Basically, there are people who go and download the different registers that make it searchable by any term. You should look at that. Scraper Wiki is full of different business registers. Um, and this is the link to the Panama one. I'll show you one. So, another 
to what like uh, James Steele said, you know, to see a secure box I had to travel all the way to the Bahamas. Well, I don't have to, I just go to the Google Map and type the address. And I see exactly if, uh, you know, this big business that uh, has a million worth of assets in my country is actually a shed in the middle of the nowhere, or it's uh, you know, somebody in a big business building. But I also use this for another reason. Uh, Google Maps will sometimes tell you if there are other companies who are registered on the same address. <coughs> Why is this important? Because while on paper, the company might not be owned by the same people, if it's on the same address and it's not the one big business building where there are you know, dozens of companies, but just a simple house like here in Switzerland, that means there is often a link between the company investigating and that other company. Okay. And final advice is get all records. And I'll tell you why. If you are stuck with a company from British Virgin Island, and uh, you pray to God that they have subsidiaries. If they have a company in another country, very often they will be asked to provide all documents for themselves. It means they're gonna have something which is called proxy authorization. You know, if you want to start a business in your British Virgin Island company, you have to authorize somebody to establish that company abroad. And that paper has to be in the registry. If you, um, the business registry will ask you who you are, you know, your British Virgin Island company, but who you are. So very often you will see a registry of directors, and you, you will see registry of shareholders, and you will even get the copies of the passports of the people you're investigating, with the date of birth and many other information. It proves super, super, super useful. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to get all the records from the Slovenian business registry. I know in online, it's, you know, there are few information, but not everything. If you go physically to the business registry, it's amazing what kind of information you can get. Just amazing. You know, I, I, I haven't done stories in Slovenia, but for example, I reported in Croatia, and I went to the local court. And even though I'm not, I'm, well, I am actually a citizen of Croatia, but even if I was, I would have the same equal access. Uh, and in, all, in most countries in Europe, you know, foreign citizens and local citizens have same access to information. So, when I went to that court, you know, I got all the documents, including all the documents on owners. I was looking at the company which was owned by the Spanish company. So, I got all the documents involving the Spanish company. But also, I got the loan agreements. You wouldn't expect that to find it there? Well, it was there. I got the loan agreement showing that the Japanese company was giving the guarantees for the loan taken in the country. It was actually be used in a story later on and it proved that the Mitsubishi big Japanese company was heavily fun financing the uh, tuna business in Croatia. Uh, I also find the court rulings. Again, you know, you would be very much surprised like what the court rulings that were, are doing there. Well, you know, sometimes they do. You find them. It's, it's really, really incredible what kind of things, you know. Another company I was investigating, I found um, uh, it was a uh, bank service basically a letter from the bank stating all the amount of cash that company has received from the Seychelles. And exactly from who? No, I wouldn't find that information otherwise if I didn't do, you know, move my ads and actually go to the business registry, spend a few hours and get all the documents. So, another tool you should use. And finally, uh, during the workshop there was a session of mapping information. Uh, very often when I'm doing this kind of investigations, it involves, you know, 30, 50, hundred companies for if you hold it all in your head yes you, you feel like your head is spinning it's going to blow at any moment you're just going to split all, spill all these companies so map them out this is what uh, the final map for the um, Tilia Sonera investigation looked like and those are all not, not even all those companies they're just the companies we use in the uh, stories so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, different offshore jurisdictions and what kind of records you could get um, a huge amounts of money ends up in the offshores. Uh, you know, and people every time they hear, oh, it's a you know, Cyprus company, it's a Seychelles company, they just stop. They're like, it's too hard to get anything there, and they're waiting for somebody to give them information. You shouldn't. This is a business registry of Panama. Um, I first put a link to the business registry and um, official business registry, and then you have a script registry. Well, what Scrape Register allows you to do is to search by a name, any name. You know, just pick a typical surname. 
and see if that person has a company as a panel. And that's what we've done. You know, my colleague from Azerbaijan, <coughs> Paul Michael, mentioned that uh, she was looking. She was just searching, searching the surname of her present, president's family, and she, there were a bunch of results. But it turned out that uh, his do names of his daughters, the two daughters, and a wife appeared. It had like a number of stories. One of the story was how they own a stake in a telecom business in Azerbaijan. Okay. Uh, the other one was a story how they own uh, shares in the UK company which uh, uh, got concessions for the huge gold mine in Azerbaijan. They also find a company which was actually building a, in a construction company that was in charge of the construction of the concert hall for Eurovision. No, that all came out of just searching by names in this Panama database. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you will see that in Panama you can, you can actually get even the copies of the documents. Uh, these are the, normally they contain information on the directors, not shareholders. But see, you can see a real, real paper copy which has been scanned and it's available online in the registry. The Cyprus. Uh, it opened up about two years ago. It's been used by very few people, but um, you know, all across Eastern Europe, Balkans. Um, criminals, politicians, they all use Cyprus to hide their assets. You know, my favorite example was the son of a president of Montenegro. He owned a company which all the time they claimed was actually a Spanish company. And that company has uh, taken the loan which they got the local government to guarantee. Well, they disappeared with the money and uh, Budva was stuck with two million bill. Nobody knew who they were. There were these nasty Spanish people who robbed the local economy. Well, not exactly. It was the son of the president. Um, this is what the typical um, uh, printout of the database looks like. This costs 10 euros. You can all afford 10 euros. And you will get the names of directors, <coughs> even their addresses and date of birth. And for the companies, you will get you know, how much share they have and where they're registered. And if they're big persons, you will get the password number. So it's very, very good. And in some cases, if a company would have a loan, for example, uh, you can get that information as well and you know, who they got the loan from. Um, before I talk about Hong Kong, I don't have a Delaware here, but for example, I, most of you don't know this, but if you go, and I'm sure that you will all come across Delaware. Uh, so in Delaware, if you go to the uh, online website, and you try to search for the company, you will get nothing, even if you pay the $20 um, dollars for like the big report. It's nothing there. But then if you find a company, in the US they have a lot of companies who go in and you know, get the documents for you. There are many, many of those. If you get one of those companies to go to the registry and uh, get all the documents that were filed, actually you would get the shareholder information. And uh, we've got it in some stories. You know, from the Sharich was notorious for using Delaware companies uh, to launch your money. And for a bunch of those that uh, we were investigating, we were actually able to get a real, real document, you know, with his name or name of his lawyers or people who he was close with as the shareholders and directors of the companies. So, you know, very few people know that that kind of information is available. It's actually available in microchip films. So actually when you go to the business registry there, they will tell you to, you know, go and search the microphone, like in old, old age, but it's still there and available. Uh, another typical place in Hong Kong, again, they have a really, really good uh, business registry. And actually, you can download every single document that they have, uh, that the company has filed with the registry there online. And this is what the Hong Kong business registry looks like. Uh, you see a lot of Chinese letters, but you would get the real names you know, if, you, if you manage to struggle through the Chinese letters. Um, so, um, even if you, ha if you have a, like, um, this is the website of the investigative dashboard. Uh, we've uh, done, we built this website with the help from Google. It was, that was our latest grant. Uh, we are still uh, improving it, but what's important is that if you uh, go and sign in and it will require your uh, Google account, Gmail account, but if you go and sign in, well, actually there are two things which you don't have to sign in for. The first one is uh, Data Vault, 
Basically, we, uh, we have uploaded the Swiss, Swiss Official Gazette, the Luxembourg Official Gazette, Cyprus Official Gazette, and different other gazettes uh, here on our server, and it's searchable. So basically, you can go and just, again, the same thing, fish for information, search for different names, you know, different countries, and so on, and see what you get. And the Cyprus Official Gazette doesn't have information on the shareholders, but if the company is closed, it usually have all the information. So in some cases it's useful, in some cases it's not. But it's searchable here. And also another thing, you know, um, actually I'll call it uh, business registries. Again, if you're looking for information in a particular country, if you want to go to the Cyprus registry, you just go there. Uh, the final thing is the research desk. This is something, a project that I'm running. And uh, until now, we only had a res one researcher in Sarajevo beside me. Uh, next week, I'm going to spend a whole week in Istanbul training uh, people in Latin America, in Africa, and Middle East who are going to be uh, new researchers for their ID. And they're going to be able to provide on the ground information and get the same kind of records I can get here in Europe. So, uh, this is a research desk, and basically, it's a free service that uh, we, are, we, we got the grants to basically help reporters. So if you're stuck with uh, questions, you don't know how to you know, get, get the business information in certain countries or you have a company that you want to investigate, you can actually file a request with us and you know, as soon as we can, we'll get back with any information we can find. Uh, this is what it looks like. I might have spoken a bit faster than I thought I would. Um, so if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to respond. Or if you want to talk about some other countries, like, um, you know, Malta is equally open. You can get all the uh, business information there. Uh, Isle of Man, again, you can download a bunch of records. I'm trying to think of all countries. British Virgin Islands will sometimes give you registered directors, yes. Actually, there was this guy here, and then... Yeah, I'd just like to ask you, you said that you get like a higher company for those tools. That, that they have other archives and they dig information, but how much does it cost? Uh, it actually can be uh, quite expensive. Uh, last time we did it, a few days ago, we ordered three companies, it was $160. 160 Yeah. I mean, it's not hugely expensive. I've seen the more expensive registries, but actually if you do get the real owner's information, it's worth it, no matter how much you pay. So it's not that bad, and actually, they have the same day or next day service. So we usually normally take it up for the next day and we don't ask for certified copies. So basically as soon as you know, I send them an email, they get back to me, they say, yeah, we found the company, this is how many documents there are, this is how many pages, and they send us back you know, tomorrow. So they're, they're really, really good. And you know, very few people use it. We actually discovered it by chance. Uh, because we always thought that they are like any other business registry, you know, that they wouldn't have really information. It turns out they have a lot. We just have to kind of make an effort and ask for it. Can you talk a little bit about um, Liechtenstein? We have a lot of Alex. <laughs> we need um, all you can um, give us about Liechtenstein. Well, actually, um, Liechtenstein does allow some information. Not the uh, who owns the foundation. We wouldn't find that. But they have some information, but you have to prove uh, the interest which is the most difficult part. Basically, you have to uh, prove that you are the, and that you have a legal reason why you're requesting certain information. And it usually doesn't go well for the reporters. Now, the way I'm looking to Liechtenstein, I go and check um, the, uh, the big databases. So I look into their subsidiaries, and then I collect any information from their subsidiaries. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about one, which is the Netherlands. Okay. That's another um, tax haven, and uh, you know there are many, many companies which are owned in the Netherlands. Netherlands actually has a very good uh, online database, uh, but there is a better part, which is they require companies to file the reports, yearly reports. And not always, but in many cases I've run across, those yearly reports would have, you know, uh, normally when you look at the shareholdings in the database, it is some kind of registration agent. But in the, uh, in the real the annual report, you would actually see the true shareholders. So they say who the shareholders are. But even better, because they have to file a financial report. Or actually not, not a profit and loss sheet, but actually just a balance asset sheet. 
Uh, they usually have uh, information on, for example, assets they own. So, the, you know, in one case, I had a company who said, like, oh, we bought this apartment building in London for this amount of money in this day, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then they would tell you uh, if the company has taken loans, you would have actually have a breakdown of all the loans that the company has taken and from who. If it has given loans, you would have that information. And also, you would have information on um, any. Uh, on any uh, other businesses that that company owns and basically what's the value of those businesses. So there's actually a lot, a lot of information in the uh, annual reports of the Dutch companies. And also, what's also interesting, you know, I told you about getting the paper rec records. We were actually able to get all the paper records from the Dutch registry as well. In one case, we were investigating and so like this big pile of documents which came to our, you know, to our Sarajevo office. The same thing goes with Switzerland, you know, very, very often, you know, well, it, it depends on the cantons, you know. In some cantons, for example, the Swiss Business Registry doesn't have, uh, it has very few information and you need to rely on official gazettes and so on. But even in those registries, you can actually call the registry and ask them to send you copies of all the documents that have been filed. And while in online version, you might not have the names of shareholders, in the version that they have, physically have, if you request the documents, very often you will see even a contract on the sale of shares. That's a very, very good tip. And in some cases, in some, um, even some handouts, you can have all the information on the companies, like paper records, you can get actually online. They have this thing where, I um, wish I had my computer to be much easier, but let's see if, um, Uh, Swiss business um, registry. Okay. Um, okay. So, for example, in case of this company, let me just see. So, it's still, yeah. If you see on a on a Swiss uh, business registry this kind of uh, sign, like a paper sign, that usually means that all the documents are actually available online, and all you have to do is basically. Click here, and you get uh, you know you have to put your name and your surname and your email address, and literally within five minutes you will get the complete file. And you have to do it for each of these because all the documents are basically grouped based on changes, you know, in the company. So the first document would normally be in corporation and so on, and then when there was a, if they sold the company, whatever, those are the documents are available. You just have to do it. They're in German. So in Switzerland, I know it's a, everybody says it's a really tough place, but actually you would be amazed how many useful information you can find if you actually go through the trouble, you know, because they don't, often don't want to speak English and they kind of ignore you, so you have to do it with German or with French or blah, 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 blah. So if you go through the hassle of actually doing it, sometimes it's uh, very much worth it. I'm trying to think of some other, um, you know, in Austria they're also good, um, because Austria is kind of like, it, it's in between the you know tax haven and it's like in between you know hiding and not hiding. So when you have a company in Austria which is really troublesome, again it's possible to get all the offline records and um, get information there as well. Yeah. Is there something like a searchable database of real estate? Because you showed us that in most cases dirty money resurfaces through real estate. So is there an application that would combine like different catasters so we could search through through that? Unfortunately no. I mean some countries are good, some countries are bad, like in US, my other the Florida land registry and in uh, New York State land registry are perfect. You can search by any uh, search term. Um, here in the Balkans I think um, Montenegro is, for example, good. You can search if you know the personal ID number. Um, I think in um, some other countries you have to know exactly the plot, but that's where you know scraping comes from. So if you can scrape with the worldwide, it helps. But also the land registry will very often, uh, if you send them um, name of the person you're investigating and information of that person or the names of companies, they would actually look it up for you. Uh, we just had a case. Um, I don't remember if it was, um, maybe it was either Switzerland or some other country where we, uh, no, it was um, Luxembourg. Uh, and we actually, I, 
we, I actually did it as a favor to a friend, so I didn't, in the end I didn't get records because I told her how she can get it. But basically they said, uh, if you send us the name of the person or the company you're looking into, we can do the search and uh, get back to you. So actually those countries. Now, on the assets, in the foreign countries, they normally wouldn't have assets that go to directly on their name because it's very often illegal. So actually the way they do it is they go and establish companies or they go and buy companies. So for example, when I was investigating the assets in France, actually I got the, you know, the company records. And actually in the company records, I had you know, a part of the... Um, when those kind of companies are established normally in a statute, which everybody kind of doesn't want to read because it's long and it's like 10 pages of like pure shit, well, you know, at the end or somewhere in the middle of those documents, you often have a reason why the company is being incorporated. And I know here, like in the Balkans, they all put like 50 things of why they're incorporating a company. But for example, typically in France, they would say exactly why. And in this case, they told that uh, the purpose of incorporating a company is to purchase exactly this real estate. So I, I had no trouble, you know, I just basically got, oh, look at this, and you know, all I have to do is to verify that actually these people own the company. But the France is actually very good, and you should be checking, because people like to have uh, assets in France. It's a good place to have assets. And uh, their business registry is also searchable by name. So if you have a surname of the person, and I think now, they have, before you didn't have to put the year of birth, but now they ask you to put the year of birth. So if you have those two pieces of information, you can actually search and find if they have companies in France, which is very, very useful. And you know, typically they would have it in that way. So, land registry is more tough, but uh, you can basically ask them to, you know, like, oh. you don't have to go with the freedom of information request, but kind of just ask um, if they if they could search by the name of that person. Very often they will do it, especially if it's a foreign person. And if you say, oh, I don't really need your help. Uh, yeah, I came a little bit late, so I wasn't listening the whole thing. Maybe I'll, I will repeat something. But you were saying about Cyprus, uh -huh. and uh, um, in their register, it's still impossible to find the beneficial owner. You can only find the nominee owner. Well, it depends. Um, you know, yes. You know, if you're really, really smart, you're gonna hide your asset. You're gonna put all the beneficial owner. The nominee is the owner. Uh, depends on uh, you know who does it. I've seen dozens of Cyprus company uh, who have a real person as an owner, and then you know some which only have a lawyer. So it's it, yeah, it's kind of like the same as you know with any other registry. They can put the lawyer and you know or, you know attorney company registration agent to pose as a shareholder. But the very very typically you will see, especially if the company which owns the Cyprus company goes to some other jurisdiction. Then they normally put, they don't put um, in a lawyer company. They actually put a real order. So and also a good thing about Cyprus actually that's another you know sometimes they would change uh, and become uh, and they, they would change and the shareholder becomes a lawyer company. But the Cyprus actually allows you to, to see through the history. So very typically you would see that they actually have screwed up at one point in time and they had their real name there, and then later it was changed to some other. So looking into history of shareholders in Cyprus is very important, very often. The same with directors. Actually, they have the company. As far as I know, they have companies who open them, the firms then. Yes, the that's companies. the first step. Yes. So that's the first step. When you register a Cyprus company, in all companies, you would see that uh, the, share, the first shareholder is actually the registration agent who incorporated that. But very typically, you would see that they change it on the same day. So you have the first change is actually the you know, lawyer, and then you have the real shareholders who appear in the company. Actually, I went to one building there, huh? and there are all Greek people who have the post there. So they are mostly Slovenians. I went to buildings oh, yeah, of yeah. the firm. I didn't okay. use Google Map, I was there on a vacation, so I went okay. there. <laughs> it's actually a building with the Greek people who own the post. Oh. Okay, okay, so the that Slovenians are smart. <laughs> well, I don't know, I, I don't know, I've, um, I, I, I mean, I, typically, I, I'm, the most of the stories I've done involve Montenegro, so, and, and Serbia, and most of them are not that smart. <laughs> But Slovenia, it might be. I don't, I don't know. I haven't done enough research into Slovenians. So 
know, maybe some other people who dealt with such, you know. I mean, yes, in some cases, you know, people are smart. They hire lawyers, they're going to hide it. Not often very well, because I still do. You can still catch them with subsidiaries with different things. But in some cases, they just don't, you know. These people in Gibraltar, they never told that anybody would look. And it wasn't just this company. Actually, there were some other companies which were owned by her boyfriend, and actually one more which was owned by, directly by her, and it had their names. They were not really, you know, careful about hiding because nobody was looking. They might get more careful now because people are starting to actually check. But before, you know, when would you go to Cyprus? You know, Cyprus was, I remember three years ago when I first time tried to get records in Cyprus before they opened the um, online registry. Uh, it was like 40 year, euros per page. And I would call them for three weeks and every time I called, the, the woman was either sick or on vacation or like, was never there. You know, it was a huge amount of money that I paid. And now it's much, much, you know, simpler to get and, and to look into. What's your opinion on the uh, uh, offshore leaks case? You know, when some, when some people scrape um, the British Virgin Islands registers, but nothing really big came out of it. So I was wondering if you know anything more about the whole case. Well, um, and the problem with that case was basically that it is like just one or two percent of the whole economy. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a literally, you know, a tiny, tiny island in the sea. And, um, you know, the information they got were basically internal communication. So it wasn't, the, you know, what was leaked wasn't the business registry. Because even if you were to leak the business registry in British Virgin Islands, you wouldn't get much because some of those jurisdictions actually don't collect information on the directors and shareholders. So there's nothing really to leak. So they were basically able to, they got the leak of uh, two companies, three actual companies, and those contained emails. And, you know, some documents that were attached to those emails. And then, it, it, you know, of course, uh, I mean, first, the, 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 the most significant findings for them will be in China and um, Asian part, Asian part of the world, because that's where those companies mainly operated. So very few people actually who are really well-known people from this region actually went. No, not just this region, but US, Europe actually went to those information agents. So it, was, it, it wasn't it was one of the top companies. You know, if there, it was a, like a Harvard Business Service or some other companies would be probably much better. But unfortunately, it's just, I mean, what, 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 what's good about them is that it shows how it works. You know, it kind of, uh, you know, showed what everybody kind of, um, Suspected, which is like this, those registration agents that are actually helping people uh, launder their money. They're help, you know, telling people how to do it, which was, which is something they shouldn't be doing. It's kind of illegal. So that that's a good thing that it gave insight in what was going on, but the sample was too small to basically you know have a real revelations. Okay, okay from the minutes. Okay, do you have questions? More questions? What happens next? So you, you find out, for example, those data databases that the uh, daughter of some president or some companies. But is this already enough for you, or do you try to make a key interview with that person? So ask her why, what, what, why do you have, what, you, why are the owner of that company? And if you do that, how do you do it? Do you try to trick her, for example? Do you have any any offshore companies, and they say no, no, and then okay, what's that then? Well, you know, finding, uh, you know, a fact that somebody owns a company anywhere in the world is not illegal. You know, so, yes, you know, once you find that, that there is a company, you have to find out why. You know, is this because, you know, they hold significant assets in their, own, in their own country and they're trying to hide it? Is it because they have committed the fraud or they're laundering money and so on? So you have to f figure out, you know, why they're doing it. And um, basically, on the people who have offshore, you know, you usually find out what kind of things they've done with that offshore. So you, the question is not to them, like, why do you have this offshore, but actually, why have you done what you did? So that's a typical question. Now, we sometimes use a trick to find out who actually is behind the offshore. So we would call, we would, for example, call a registration, a, a registration agent or a person or a lawyer who is the director of the company, and we would tell them, like, so, we're just writing an article, you stole 10,000 10, euros from whatever, from this government, and you're the corrupt person, blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, no, 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 no. And sometimes it scares them off, so they go and tell me, like, no, 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 I'm just acting on behalf of this person. 
actually a very good tactic, you know, to use when you know you're at the end and then and you, you don't know what to, what to do anymore, and then you just call that person and tell them like, we're gonna write a really really nasty article. You you've done this. It's really bad. You know, and police is gonna come and knock on the doors because normally, you know, if I mean, the, okay, lawyers know what they're doing, but very often you'll see that sometimes, you know, like this guy, young woman, she was just a personal assistant. It's not like she really understood what she's taking. And actually, you know, with taking the director job at the company, you actually get the criminal responsibility for anything that that company does. So you would see that, you know, sometimes, you know, the people whose identity is stolen and they become a director of a company without knowing that. You know, if the company ends up accused for the fraud and they get end up in a huge, you know, trouble, proving they had nothing to do with it. Because, you know, legally they had. So, you know, very often those people will actually come like, oh, no, 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 I haven't done anything, and these are people. I mean, a very fun case happened to us once in Delaware. This is the last thing I'm going to hear, you know, it's, um, you're running out of time. So our, our reporter actually went to Delaware to the registration agent and told him, you're working for the biggest drug lord in Europe. You know, we are writing a story about you. You're the director of his company. <laughs> the guy was, like, so scared, he ended up giving him a full list of every other company he ever incorporated. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>